Well, as announced, um, we interrupt uh, our study of the book of Hebrews that we just began uh, because of Pentecost. Let's talk about Pentecost today. And uh, of course, we find uh, the story in um, Acts chapter 2. And I want to begin to read from verse 16, a portion. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, <clears throat> and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this is the beginning of the very first sermon in the new church of God. You can say the very first sermon ever in the church, and this contains a quote to the Old Testament. And it is from the prophet Joel. Um, you can find the, the words that Peter quotes here in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And so it's interesting to see what is the context of this prophecy um, spoken by Joel. And we find it in Joel chapter 2, verse 1. There it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The context is the day of the Lord, the end of the age. And um, Peter says about it uh, in Acts 2 verse 16, This is that. It has begun. It, it is here. And... Um, I think that if uh, he would have given this sermon today, he would most probably have said, this is it, this is it. The end times were, had just begun uh, at that time, but um, yeah, we are really at the, the, the end of it now. This is it. We are here. Isn't it amazing that the first sermon in the church speaks about this subject? And now, uh, towards the end of the church age, uh, it's, um, it's especially missing um, in, in most churches and in most sermons. God will call us at the end uh, of this age and before the day of the Lord. How is he going to call us? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, with a trumpet. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, he writes, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And John writes in Revelation 4, verse 1, a trumpet that talks. And even Moses wrote about it in Exodus, uh, Exodus 19, uh, a voice of a trumpet and the voice of God. We see continuously the same pattern. There are more verses, by the way. So how are we going to hear and understand this voice? Well, the truth is that only some of us will. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, for they know my voice. And not all are his sheep. So, what does this have to do with Pentecost? Well, yeah, it has to do with Pentecost because of the last day, but also because um, it all has to do with communication. Um, the rapture, Will, uh, will be lauded with a, a shout, a call, the voice of God, the voice of a trumpet, um, the voice of the archangel. There, there will be communication. And um, the, the point is, can we, can we hear and understand that call? So back to uh, the day of Pentecost. Let's look at the nature of this miracle and also those that were involved in it. In Genesis uh, 11, we can read how God uh, confounded the languages uh, among mankind and uh, that made it very difficult, if not impossible, to communicate. 
And here at Pentecost, this, uh, this shortcoming was temporarily healed. Uh, not in the sense that they spoke and uh, all spoke and understood one another and all shared the same language, but the audience could hear uh, the disciples all speak each in his own language. The disciples, they spoke languages that they had not learned. Uh, the change happened in the disciples. They spoke different. And actually, they were Galileans, and Galileans had a specific dialect of Aramaic, uh, which, which was called Shibboleth, and you find this word in the Judges uh, chapter 12, verse 6. And it, it identifies the speaker's background. From the Jerusalem uh, leadership, uh, they would say about people who had this dialect, that they were the villagers, they were more low class. That's how they saw them. Uneducated. And so to them it was very surprising that these men could speak all these languages and fluently. Um, and that comes out in Acts uh, chapter 2 verse 7 through 11. It says there, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That was truly a miracle. It was amazing to them. Pentecost was a miracle of language. It enabled communication between men, the disciples, to the audience. But it was talking or speaking uh, about the communication, pointing to the communication between God and man. Communication that God had enabled between himself and mankind. And he had enabled it through Jesus. Um, he had announced it. This was the promise of the Father. Jesus announced it in Acts 1 verse 4 uh, when he says to his disciples, you wait here in Jerusalem for the promise uh, of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And of course in John chapters 14 and 15, Jesus speaks abundantly about this. Uh, there was now a two-way communication between us and God. And that is uh, truly the amazing thing, because, because faith is a relationship. And uh, I've said this uh, a couple of times lately, because maybe also I've come to realize this more uh, intense myself. Faith is not a, a worldview, it's not a belief system, it is a relationship, a relationship with Jesus. And a relationship cannot exist without communication. Um, there must be some common language between the two parties, otherwise they, they cannot establish a relationship. And the communication channel with God was open. God hears man's cry. This is what Joel uh, also proclaims. He says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We just read it from the mouth of Peter who quotes this. And this is vital at the end of history as we know it, eh? the last days, uh, as we see in Acts uh, 2 verse 17. This is it. And so, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord hears, and conversely, he allows the one who calls upon him to hear him. It becomes now a two-way um, communication. It's, there will be a common language between the saved one and God. And it's established through the Holy Spirit and it's made possible through Jesus. Soon the voice of the trumpet, the voice of God, will sound. And when we have not established this relationship, we won't even hear it, let alone understand it. It is critical and it's a critical time. We can truly say, this is it. Now notice that it says in verse 10 of Acts 2, Jews and proselytes, we get this whole list of all these nations that are present there, um, and, and then it says Jews and proselytes. 
which means Jews and those that have turned to the Jewish faith but were not born Jews. And it shows that um, the Jews from before the diaspora, from before um, 70 AD, were um, very much missionaries. They went everywhere to spread their religion. They did so far and wide. And Jesus refers to this in Matthew 23, verse 15. Um, well, he's uh, criticizing, but he brings this up. Um, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. Yeah. So uh, that's what they did. They, they would go uh, to different countries. They would cross seas uh, to find people to make them uh, Jews. And uh, that's also why there were uh, synagogues throughout the Roman Empire. And we read, of course, about that uh, throughout the book of Acts. Wherever Paul goes, he always first goes to the synagogue. They were everywhere. So very different from um, how Judaism is today. Today it's much more a, an ethnic thing. You have to be born Jew in order to be a real Jew. And otherwise, yeah, you are a Goim, a Gentile, and um, at best you can be a righteous Gentile, but that's only for a very few. So that it's, it's really different. Um, but here, Gentiles, proselytes were included. And Peter was aware of this. When he quoted Joel's words, Joel said, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever means anyone, everyone. Uh, there is no distinction. Um, and so that includes the Gentiles. Everyone has access to God's salvation. God does not speak in a language that's only for some privileged, um, but it's for everyone. Uh, salvation is a gift that is for every soul. God had opened the communication channels and what sounded was good news, very good news. And even more, or maybe especially so, because uh, of the context um, of Joel's quote. Eh? We just read what Peter says. Uh, there is this gloomy doom uh, situation, uh, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The day of the Lord comes uh, with, um, with all this and so... Um, that's really a doom scenario. But in the midst of this, there is this good news. This time, this time of doom, the time of the, the wrath of the Lord, is upon the earth. And so it is vital that, that man calls upon the name of the Lord. And so one question could be, what is the name of the Lord that, that man should call and it's a question of all. Moses asked, um, asked the same thing in Exodus 3. He says to God, what is your name? What is your name? And Solomon um, actually challenges us to, to say the name. Uh, in Proverbs 30 verse 4, um, he says, what is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. And this is a, a rhetorical question. He's basically saying, you know, say it. And he's with that challenging um, yeah, everyone, of course, but also, also maybe in, in a special sense, the Jewish readers who have all these prophecies who actually, actually they know, but they don't want to know at the same time. Um, so that's really a challenge, this, this um, verse here from Proverbs. Paul repeats Joel's statement um, in Romans 10 verse 13. He says also, uh, whoever uh, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he adds right away in the next verse, verse 14, but how can they call if they don't believe? So there the point is not so much you have to know the name, but the point is you have to have faith. Um, and of course you know the name then, but uh, faith is the, the important thing, the crucial thing. And then a few verses further, verse 17, he says, faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. So you have to hear it. How can you hear it? You have to, to there has to be communication. So once you, you, you call out, um, God will make you understand, gives you a heart of understanding through his Holy Spirit. And this initial call, um, it can be, in whatever way, as long as it's from the heart and sincere, 
God will hear it and he will answer and he will answer and then then you will hear his voice and understand uh, there will be communication um, so what is the name yeah we, we know of course Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth there is no doubt about it it's all about Jesus So God calls in a way, and he calls with a language that all can hear. And so what is the response? Because we have to remember God calls us first. And our cry out to God can only be because we know there is a God. He has called us first. He has written his name already in our hearts. Um, he calls. He calls with a language that we understand, that every human being understands. What is the response? That's the question. There are only two possibilities. Um, if we go to Psalm 95, verse 7 and 8, it says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Now that's the one option, to harden your heart and to to reject him. Uh, that's not uh, the best uh, choice, obviously. Um, interesting in this verse is that it's, it says, He is our God and we are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hands. So we are God's people, yet uh, he calls us. It's not enough to, to show your membership of, uh, of the, the church uh, when you are and uh, want to enter heaven. Uh, um, you can say, I am a Christian, but that's not enough. You have to answer his call. And the, the, the uh, relationship has to be established. That is what it's about. And so that's why he says, even to, to his own people, to you and me um, today, when you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Uh, this is quoted in Hebrews 4, verse 7. Uh, it says there, again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. He limited a certain day. It, it, he doesn't give opportunities forever. Um, as long as we have breath and our heart is beating, um, we have time. But it, it ends at some point. And so it's, uh, it's um, critical that we answer this call and we answer it not tomorrow. He says today, today. Um, so, hard in your heart is one option. As I said, that's not the best choice. It's the worst you can do, of course. Um, what is the other option? Well, that's exactly what the, the audience that Peter spoke to on the day of Pentecost asked. They said um, in uh, Acts 2, verse 37 through 39, let's read it. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The first thing in the answer to the question, what shall we do, is repent. You have to repent. You have to, to make a U-turn. Go the other direction because you're going the wrong direction. And, and be baptized. Without repentance, there is no salvation. But those that do repent, they, uh, they receive uh, the Holy Spirit. Eh? When they receive Jesus as the Savior, they receive the Holy Spirit. That is a promise, Peter says in verse 39. It's a promise, a promise to you, to your children, and all those that are afar off. All those that are afar off. These are those that, uh, uh, that were not born in Israel, that were not born Jews. Uh, it has nothing to do with it. It's for everyone, all those that are afar off. Joel says, uh, the remnant whom the Lord calls. Uh, it's for everyone. And that promise of the Holy Spirit is crucial. Because that will allow the receiver to hear God's voice. And we see here in this miracle of Pentecost, 
die, uh, die uh, shadow uh, of it, that is, that is um, shown to us, um, how all of us, each one individually, can hear God in his own language, understandable. This is what it's about, and so uh, that is what the miracle shows. And that's a promise. That means that there is direct two-way access to the Father. As we see when Jesus dies on the cross, the veil is torn, the separation, the breach is restored. Paul writes about this in Ephesians 2 verse 12. And at that time, uh, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There is now direct access. And now that we have access, we can hear his voice and understand his voice. And we can hear his call. And he will call. He will call. It is nigh, very nigh, it's upon us. Again I say, this is it. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 says, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is it. Amen. <laughs>